Hello everyone. This month's report, we have the pleasure to announce the inclusion of the Ohio Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory to the SDRS network of BDLs. In this month's podcast, we'll have a discussion with the ADDL team, represented here by Dr. Richard French, who is the director of the ADDL laboratory, Dr. Yang Zeng, the virology section head, and Melanie Prairiet. Also, we have the presence, presence of Dr. Danny Summers, who is the state veterinarian for the state of Ohio. Now, the Ohio DDL joins the SDRS network along with the VDLs from the Iowa State University, University of Minnesota, Kansas State, and South Dakota VDL. Now, the SDRS accounts for more than 95% of all per science samples tested at Level 1 National Animal Health Laboratory Network. Hello and welcome to the Swine Disease Reporting System. This is a report number 44. My name is Edison Magalhães here at Iowa State University. Hello, my name is Giovanni Trevisan here at Iowa State University. Hello, Daniel Linhares, also at Iowa State. And today we're going to cover the SDRS findings for, for the month of, of September 2021. But just before we get started, so the, the SDRS is a project that was established in 2017 with a goal of sharing information on endemic and emerging diseases affecting the swine populations in the U.S. So assisting veterinarians and producers in making informed decisions on disease, disease prevention, detection, and management. And today is a special day for us here at the, the SDRS uh, because we are expanding our capability, capabilities and regional representativeness by having Ohio Animal Disease and Diagnostic Laboratory join the SDRS network. And it's a pleasure to have today here the, the Ohio team us here. So uh, Melanie uh, Melanie Prerich, she has been the Ohio leader is in this endeavor. So welcome. Can you can you help us to, to introduce the whole Ohio team? Sure. Hi everybody. Uh, I'm Melanie Prerich from the Ohio Animal Disease Diagnostic Lab, and we are very excited to be joining SDRS. It's something I've wanted to do for a number of years now. And with me today, I have our interim state veterinarian, our laboratory director, and our virology section head. Uh, Dr. Summers, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm, I'm Dr. Dennis Summers. I'm the interim state veterinarian for Ohio. Uh, pleasure to be here, and just uh, uh, want to share that uh, we support all this uh, great collaborative effort and happy to participate. So good morning to everybody. Morning. Thanks, Dr. Summers. Dr. French? You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Richard French. Uh, I'm the new director of the Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory here in Ohio. I've been here uh, just for about three months, uh, but I'm very excited to add to a network of laboratories for this uh, SDRS. Okay, thank you, Dr. French. Uh, Dr. Zhang? Hey, my name's Ian Zhang. I, um, I've been with the Diagnostic Labs about 20 years. Um, we started our um, capability of building the database uh, around the same time, actually, 2017, 2018. And Le Melanie has been uh, a you know, leader in this field, and it's it's good to join the collaborative effort to uh, be able to share our information and uh, um, join the collaboration. Thank you, Dr. Perrett, What motivated the Ohio team to join the SDRS network? So Ohio is one of the top 10 hog and pig states in the United States. Uh, we have over 2.6 million hogs and pigs in Ohio and over 3,500 farms that have pigs on them. Most of them are concentrated in Northwest Ohio. Um, we do a lot of testing in our laboratory for various pig diseases and we accumulate a lot of data including sequence data and PCR data. And to me, it made sense to share that data at a national level to help with disease management, prevention, 
trends and patterns over time to help track uh, emerging uh, or emergency outbreak situations. That's great. Welcome. Thank you. I'm excited. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very, very good. We are all excited to have you guys on board. And Dr. French, would you be able to give an overview of the lab for us? Sure. Uh, the, the ADDL is a full-service diagnostic laboratory. Uh, we are a, uh, we're fully accredited by AAVLD, uh, and we are a non-level one laboratory. Uh, so we are involved in also disease surveillance of a number of diseases that are important to the swine industry. Um, and as a full service laboratory, uh, of course, we have uh, pathology, molecular, micro, serology, uh, and, and other services available. Um, I also so think it's important to recognize that we're a, uh, an FDA LFFM or genome tracker lab. Uh, so we have full capability for sequencing NGS uh, whole genome sequencing, and we regularly track uh, our pathogens in the swine industry. And this will all be critical to, I think, this role of networking laboratories and understanding disease across the nation. Great, thank you. Now, question for, for Dr. Summers. Dr. Summers, how projects like the, the, the SDRS and the U.S. SHIP has helped the connection between swine stakeholders, in your opinion? How has like, projects like the SDRS contributed to help state veterinarians and on an epidemiological, with the epidemiological information? Uh, yeah, so I, I guess the way I look at it right now is, you know, a lot of the information that's gathered and the data that's gathered through the lab system and through NON is looking at endemic diseases that could model the transmission of a foreign animal disease. And so that's kind of where I started to peak up an interest with this a couple of months ago mm -hmm. uh, with this interim capacity that I'm currently sitting here for the Department of Agriculture. And I realized that it's, it's important to monitor that and see that. For example, I use the, the best example is PERS. PERS can look like ASF. And so if it's helpful mm -hmm. for us to understand the distribution and, and the, the data that comes out of tracking PERS, for example, through this project, it helps me uh, get a better understanding and collaborate with our industry stakeholders to say that, hey, if you see a spike in some PERS activity, maybe there's maybe there's something else there that, that we should look at that's, that's under. If you think it's PERS, for example, we would use this data potentially as a catalyst or a platform to jump off to say, hey, maybe we should come out and do an FADI an investigation or, or see if they would be willing to do that because maybe you've got something else underneath there that, that's brewing that you don't know about. And so really it's just about us being able to look at endemic disease as a model for foreign animal disease. Uh, and I, I use ASF and PERS as a good example. The other thing that's, a, that's you know, in the works right now that we also find value, I, I, I know the lab does and I do, is, as you mentioned, with U.S. SHIP, if the U.S. SHIP, SHIP uh, project, which is uh, in its embryonic stages right now as a pilot program. If it comes online and is successful as a nationally supported monitoring system that has a set of standards and testing capabilities that will allow us to get better uh, peacetime data for ASF and CSF uh, surveillance, for the lack of a better term, um, that's advantageous for us and on multiple capacities. And so that's where I, again, from my, I kind of inject myself into it at that point, because if SHIP becomes a reality and it's codified as a, as a program, this very data here, again, it can help support that program uh, with, with ASF monitoring. So while I'm not really into the day-to-day -day activities of the lab, I look at the data coming out of the lab and what the lab is doing to help support basically higher level programs that we want to, that we want to, to have in place and support or not just for Ohio, but for the U S uh, the swine industry. That's fantastic. Yeah. So, so again, thank you. Thank you all from, from Ohio. We're pretty excited to have you uh, on board. It's going to be important for the swine disease reporting system to increase the representativeness in the, in the state and surrounding 
uh, area, right? And we, uh, Dr. Summers, it's the f you're the first uh, official vet also in the in the program, and bringing that perspective for us is gonna be it's gonna be a a, a win for for us too, right? So looking for uh, how the how this uh, program can further help with preparedness. Uh, the swine, the uh, swine herd here. So, so all, all good. And we also uh, excited to have the support from Dr. Andrea Ahuda back at the university, right? She, she, I know she works closely with uh, with, you, with you all, and she's gonna also bring some additional epi applied epi perspective on the on what else can we do with this data to better serve the the industry. So, welcome you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so, Giovanni, moving on to, to the report by itself, let's cover the findings from the month of September. Uh, what did you find? What were the major findings in terms of PCR detection? Well, let's start by agent. So, PERS virus, the detection was similar in September when compared to August. But what we see there is that detection in the winter market age category was very similar with uh, small uh, signals for increased detection at the end of uh, September. So we may be some changes occurring there. Additionally to that, we are closely monitoring the PERS virus 144 L1C variant strain. And the number of sequences due in September was similar across all weeks. I remind you that the last few weeks of September you still have some uh, diagnosed that sequence that could come from. So uh, maybe the point where we start to see some change for PERS virus detection. On enteric coronavirus detection, uh, Delta coronavirus did follow a trend for the decrease in this year. PD, there was some activity detected in winter market age category, and the advisory group did remind us that that was done because of active surveillance. So uh, that helped to early detect this uh, sites that those were positive in that specific region or uh, systems and they remind us to keep an eye to do active surveillance and use that information for applied biocontainment to avoid the spread of the agents across farms. One thing that is very important for us as a system is that from September of 2020 up to uh, September of 2021 more than 40,000 cases contained more than 130,000 samples was tested for TG, and only three of those submissions was positive. So it's a very, uh, very low number and a percentage of positive cases with TG virus detection. Got to get rid of that one. Yeah, that, that's very exciting to see very low numbers. And when we look for our mycoplasma high money, uh, the detection went up this month. And that is according to the expected for this time of the year. Any additional comments? I think that's the, that's the picture we see here as well. We don't see much uh, TGE going on. Okay. Um, PED and the Delta occasionally is hot. Even in summer, we detect them, but it's not very high. Um, we see quite a few... Uh, PERS, when Melanie can probably share more information, the specific data so she's been tracking those. But um, SIV, we see that uh, H1N2 lately, and um, you know, other um, majority, we see the H3N2. Giovanni, what about in terms of disease diagnostic de detection from the, the ISU VDL? Well, during uh, August and September, we got some uh, signals for increased uh, detection of confirmed disease diagnosed for influenza A and mycoplasma hyomone. So in the most recent two weeks, there was a spike in number of confirmed diagnosed for influenza A, a model specifically. This month, we brought alive a redesigned, redesigned page to present this information about confirmed disease with etiologic uh, uh, confirmation. So we did put there some changes in the chart. First, it was a pirate chart presenting what was the most frequent confirmed disease in the etiologies over all diagnoses that were received at the CUVDL. And then we broke that by system using some uh, Venn diagrams. And that presents uh, bubbles with specific agents. And where the bubbles 
do connect between them will represent the number of uh, confirmed etiological disease in a single case. So you can start to play around with, with those lines and see how may, many uh, co-detections uh, there are between those agents. So enjoy the new page and feel free to reach us if you have any questions for mm -hmm. that. It's really interesting. Please double check there in the in the report this new new information that Giovanni is bringing. So moving on, uh, Dr. Zeng, you identified porcine Delta coronavirus in the in the U.S. in 2014 14 and produced the first report linking the virus to to a disease outbreak. And in 2021, we have some increased regional activity of this agent in the Midwest and Southwest uh, region in the U.S. What are the, the potential uh, route for causes for, for this? Any, any information, genetic, any genetic change of the virus? What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, we actually uh, currently were uh, working with the Ohio State University, Dr. Chiu Hun Wan's lab on the sequencing of the Delta coronavirus. Um, we haven't done any sequencing uh, Lately, but the whole genome sequencing, I think this is uh, uh, will be interesting to see. But we did some uh, uh, sequencing data for um, PED virus um, using the deep sequencing. Actually, uh, this is actually published in 2018 um, with also with Dr. Wang's group. There is some uh, um, gene deletion PED virus. As using deep sequencing, you can find them, but using the regular, you will not be able to find them. So I hope this is something that uh, we can use the next generation sequencing to find some uh, variant that's similar to the TGE or the PD uh, virus. That's great. And the, the work is in progress, yes. That's great information. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Zeng. And when we look for TG, we have very, very few cases that are positive in the last few years. What do you think have contributed for this almost disappearance of TG? And can we learn something from that to uh, get rid of PED and Delta coronavirus? Sure. Actually, um, in 2015, we published one paper in the emerging um, disease that, uh, you know, with, uh, PRCV is very commonly detected in the, the surveillance sample in Ohio. So we did some sequencing and we find that uh, we find that actually new variant strain of the PRCV. Uh, I think this is a, we think this is a highly possible that, uh, you know, PRCV actually serving as a natural vaccine um, for the P, uh, TGE, that that's why we don't see much TGE going on in the P, uh, you know, PED and the Delta virus, it probably something similar because we did see that uh, um, PED virus, the mutant strain and uh, the deletion in the spike gene that may play a role because, you know, we don't see that um, like 2013, 2014, when it first started, we see lots of the since going on, but since we don't use, use the vaccine, that maybe the natural vaccine play a role here. Um, so, and if I, if I recall correctly, the uh, PRCV, the porcine respiratory coronavirus, the uh, TGE is uh, evolved from that virus, right? So they're closely related. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's exactly exact the same virus, but the, the spike genes that have uh, um, the hundred. Uh, nuclear acid deletion, 130 something. But, uh, you know, the ones we detected, and uh, it's similar to what I was and also Ohio State reported, but a little bit different. So, you know, this is actually, it's been reported, the PED is being reported in Japan and other countries as well. So, yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, this actually has some interesting um for current uh, COVID-19 uh, um, epidemics, you know, we're thinking that maybe someday there's a, maybe a natural uh, occur mutant strain that have deletion that can 
third as a natural vaccine that actually can get rid of the COVID or actually can, you know, uh, mm -hmm. cause the, the mutant strain that not as violent as the current virus going. Oh, great. Was a was a great discussion, guys. And to wrap up here, we usually ask this question to, to our guests, and we want to want to ask this question for, for all of you. Uh, how do you guys envision the, the future of, of disease diagnostic and, and surveillance, uh, specifically in the, in the swine industry, taking together all that, all that we discussed and all these new approaches in terms of data analysis and using what, what we have? Starting by you, Dr. Summers. Um, so I, I guess from my perspective, one thing that, um, or can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, All right. I'm with both of these uh, devices here running at the same time. So, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so one thing that I think is important, uh, you know, for the future, I, I mean, I'm looking at really here in Ohio and at, at, at our facilities here at the diagnostic lab, also within our division of animal health is it's important that our our administrative side and our program side for the regulatory component does have more engagement with lab data. Uh, so I know that that's something that it, we've always done, but I look at it better now as a model for the future, right? I mean, this is really something that I personally think the future for what we do as state veterinarians is heavily based on prevention. And so if, if we're able to see um, what's going on with the spatial distribution of disease across Ohio and nationally. Uh, it helps us be better at, at regulatory uh, individuals. It helps us in, it put some better preventative measures in place mm -hmm. with our response plan. And if you're using endemic diseases as a model, because they look so much like foreign animal disease, I can help and I can rely on the lab staff who are much better versed and are subject matter experts on it. If Dr. French or Dr. Zhang say, hey, we're seeing something that's going on. There's an uptick here. And, you know, one focal point of an industry a producer in one focal area may not see it. But if you if you broaden that picture and you look at it on a wider area and wider distribution, you may be seeing some some disease movement that may trigger us on the regulatory side to get engaged and, ha and just start, if nothing else, ask questions. Yeah. So yeah. I find value in that. Um, where I think we can do, uh, not that we haven't done a good job, but we can always improve and tapping into the laboratory side on the data side uh, on a more regular interval, I think will help me as, as interim state veterinarian. So I, I, I welcome this uh, collaboration. So so one, one quick uh, follow-up comment in, on that, uh, Dr. Summers, is something that we have on the works here, which is to monitor not only the pathogen activity, but also monitor the the negative tests closely, right, uh, Giovanni, and try to understand, well, people are submitting those samples for PERS, it's testing negative, but there's an increase in negative samples for PERS, what that may, may mean, right? So we, we saw That's that right. happening when PD emerged, a lot of samples being submitted for TGE, it was negative for TGE, and guess what, there was an emerging problem that was not TGE, but people didn't know, so they test what they know what, what they know for, right? That's right. That's, that's exactly what I'm hoping to benefit is even if just one time, even if just one time that it's caught through the lab, maybe the lab could be the one says the, you know, if they're watching those movements, but the producer says, hey, I thought it was TGE or PERS, but my testing came back negative. But you're seeing a, a rise in their sample submissions. Obviously, that indicates that there's a disease event going on mm -hmm. on the farm. Again, if you're just you, I, I, perhaps there's tunnel vision there that they're just looking for one thing, but if, if there's nothing else coming out of it, the lab would, you know, by being in part of this conversation, I could always say, Hey, maybe I should reach out or one of our field BMOs who's a foreign animal disease diagnostician should reach out to that producer and say, Hey, is there anything going on? It's out of the usual because, you know, you're submitting a lot of samples they're coming back negative, but you're obviously seeing some sort of uh, of morbidity or mortality Maybe, maybe we should get involved. And again, if nothing else, it just starts a conversation that is based to help and support the industry uh, for those uh, foreign animal disease incursions. So that's exactly right. 
And that's a great point, Dr. Summers. And it's not only when it's a new agent, but sometimes if you look for the last year, the U.S. wine industry has been busted by PERS virus. There was different strains that was affecting different regions. Some was more contemporary, like the case of Ohio and Nebraska. But there was a specific region that was Iowa and Minnesota that was this new PERS 144 and C variant strain that emerged. And when we look for the diagnostic data, and specifically SDRS information, we could get that spike back in October of 2020, and now in April and May of 2021. And those two spikes in terms of detection with high percentage of positive cases, very low CT values, was very well coinciding with this first and second wave of this new emerging pulse variant strains. So a foreign animal disease is a real threat for the United States, but the real problem nowadays is still be caused by the endemic agents. And if we do monitor them closely, I truly believe that is well aligned with what you say. We can uh, understand better the patterns that occurs here and be prepared for a foreign animal introduction in terms of understanding how that could ex- spread in the and affect the U.S. swine industry. That's right. That's absolutely right. Dr. French, any, any closing remarks? So, uh, kind of the way I I envision things in in kind of the grand scheme is is the future is actually in data, um, and I foresee uh, if we have all of our laboratories that are integrating uh, results into a data system, and then all of those labs are integrated, then we can see things happening in real time. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and the ideal to me is, is you basically have a real time diagnostics where you have a dashboard and we can see what's occurring at least regionally, uh, within a state or even nationally, um, real time when we layer on things such as geo mapping and things of that source, and then you bring in data analytics, AI, and, my what I would envision is you're taking all this data and actually making it into a live animal, artificial intelligence that's giving us information uh, real time. And that helps us see things as it's occurring, but also mitigate things down the road. Mm-hmm. Um, so in essence, it's taking all this data and making an animal out of it that helps us control disease throughout the population. Welcome to this networking. Yeah, <laughs> that's the way. Melanie, what are your, your closing remarks? And, and thanks again for all, for all the support in this, this process. Sure, thank you. Uh, just to build upon what Dr. Summers and Dr. French said, uh, pathogens don't see or care about state borders. And recently at USDA's ASF Action Week, I think a statistic came out about, um, I think about a million pigs are on the road at any given time in the United States being transported within and across states. Uh, So that means pathogens can also be traveling. So using all this data that all the BDLs are accumulating every single day from routine diagnostic testing, to me just makes sense to share that data and build up these kinds of networks and continue using next-gen sequencing to do genomic characterization to track these outbreaks in real time and identify emerging variants or new genotypes or whatever we're looking at. So um, I agree with Dr. French, data is the future, and to add to that, next-gen sequencing also is going to be critical as we continue on building this network. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Zank? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good to, you know, we joined uh, working together and using, you know, all our capabilities and, uh, and to um, quick uh, detection and quick response and, and find any emerging or new pathogens or foreign animal disease in a timely manner. It's, it's, a, it's the key for the success for the animal industry, you know. Um, you know, like Melanie said, there's no boundary for the animal health. Great. Great discussion, guys. And thanks again for, for joining 
uh, us. It's a, a win-win situation. I think it's really good for, for this project. And that was it for today. Thanks uh, to our, our, our audience to, to jo joining us today and watching the video. And I see you guys next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.